practice peace. I thought that was a bold title, how to practice peace, right? But, but I mentioned this, I think, the first week, that um, you know, our unity teachings are, are so much about principle. You know, we've got the five basic unit, they call it the five basic unity principles, which are in your bulletin. The one presence and one power, the omnipotence that is the nature of God, that same nature that's in you and in me and in all life, and that we use our thoughts and our feeling nature to literally create the world we live in, thoughts and mind, produce after their kind, garbage in, garbage out, you know, whatever it is, that's principle number three, right? And what's principle number four? Principle number four are the tools that we use. And the tools we use are prayer and meditation. And we use those tools in order to activate principle number three, which is how what we're thinking about that turns out to be the world that we're living in, right? And principle number five I love. For me, principle number five is if you don't do any of these things, why even talk about it? It's like if you're not practicing these principles, if you're not using the tools of prayer and meditation, if you're not becoming aware of the thoughts that are happening in, in consciousness that are out picturing in your world, you know, why come to unity? You know, you could just watch TV on Sunday morning. Or go have brunch, you know? <laughs> so, so I thought it was um, an important thing for us to just kind of look a little bit more deeply into, especially meditation. I mean, we do prayer with our, with our chaplains. We pray together. The prayer of St. Francis is what we know as a prayer. And, you know, it's such a powerful prayer to kind of frame in consciousness. And it's one of the reasons I wanted to have us focusing on it for the whole month rather than just kind of racing through and going, oh, that's nice. Because he kind of flips things up and upside down. And I think that's an important part of us to carry in our awareness. You know, going through the prayer, and I, I encourage people week one to actually memorize the prayer of St. Francis. So I don't know if any of you have taken me up on that challenge. But it's interesting to, um, to focus on the prayer and see the dichotomies in the first part of the prayer. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light where there is sadness joy so we he he's already set up for us these these dichotomies that we as humans can experience in our life you know we we can experience a sense of hatred i suppose you know and, and a lot of that is running through the world right now we can experience a feeling of being injured that somebody did us did us wrong we can have a, an experience of doubt in our life. We have an experience of some people really, the doubt can move us into a place of despair or depression. Mm -hmm. We can have that experience that we're living in the darkness, the dark night of the soul. We can also move into a place of sadness. So what he's doing is he's giving us a, a, the bigger picture of the experience of human life and inviting us as instruments of peace, instrument, <laughs> instrument we, we we know what an instrument a musical instrument is and i talked about that the first week about the emptiness in there and the spaciousness in an instrument that's part and the resonance that happens so we as instruments of peace we can counteract some of these things that we have experienced or that we see in the world by what he's calling forth which is love which is pardon which is faith when there is despair, hope. <laughs> I, have to, I know my, it's three Ds and an, a, and an S. That's how I know it. <laughs> hope, light, and joy. All of these things. But the question then is the next part of that prayer. And for me, the next part of the prayer, he's really framing how we do this. How we do this. Because it's one thing to say, oh, you know, I'm going to be love. Whenever there's hatred in the world, I'm going to be love. How's that working for you? 
Because we see it, don't we? I mean, we see the world we're living in. There's so much conflict going on. There's injury. We see injury out there, and we feel it in our own world. Are we in the place where we're willing to pardon, to let go, to release? Are we keeping ourselves and others in, my friend calls it eye jail, when we keep ourselves embedded in this sense of being imprisoned in some, some wrongdoing, either that somebody did or that we did to someone else. So what I see is that this second part of the prayer is a very powerful way that helps us understand how St. Francis, and I think Jesus as well, because you know, Francis was, he was bringing forth the mystical Jesus. He was bringing forth the teachings that Jesus gave to the world. And what he said is, O oh, divine master, O oh, divine master, grant that I might not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying to, dying to self, I add that, we are born into eternal life. So what he's, he, what he's inviting us into is moving out of essentially the self-centeredness that we have about our experience of all those things he's enumerated, the hatred, the injury, the doubt, the despair. He's asking us to move out of that by being a presence for other people isn't he? He's asking us to do that by, by being a presence for other people. And, and I believe unity is really inviting us into this in the fourth principle that we have of our tools of prayer and meditation. You know, I was thinking about just some of the, some of the stories of Jesus and how Jesus, Jesus was a presence. Think about Think about the story of the woman who was, had been bleeding for 12 years, and she simply came up to Jesus and touched the hem of his garment, and she was totally healed. He, he was carrying a presence. Think about the time of the, the disciples in the boat, and the boat's rocking, and they're all terrified. They're, they're, call it doubt, call it despair, whatever it was. And Jesus is asleep in the back of the boat. He's in this very peaceful place. And he's asking them, you know, where's your faith? Peace be still, where's your faith? He's got this, he's got this incredible presence. And then even something like the story of the Good Samaritan in Luke, where all the high and holy people are ignoring the person who's having a terrible experience on the side of the road. And yet there is one person who comes who's supposedly not an unclean person. The Sumerians were people that they were not part of, part, part of the tribe. Came and helped this person, took them to an inn, fed them, gave them food and clothing and shelter. So there's this quality of presence that we are being called into, and I believe it was the presence that Jesus shared in many of the stories that we have in the Bible. Feeding of the 5,000. It's a mystical experience, but it's coming from a deep place of presence. And we all have this opportunity to be presence in the world. And for me, that's the core of being an, an instrument of peace. It's that that capacity that we have to calm down the activity of the mind that's connected to what's going on out there and to find that place of peace inside ourselves. And from that place, that peaceful place, we can be an instrument of all these qualities that St. Francis is talking about. So I, I've been, uh, I picked up a couple books. Well, some of you know I've been reading this book. I'm doing a book study down in Marin with a small group of women, and it's a Buddhist book. It's The World Could Be Otherwise. And there's the chapter we were recently focusing on was a chapter on meditation. It was called The Perfection of Meditation. 
And it was basically a Buddhist practice of not thinking, <laughs> not thinking, thinking, which I'm not going to try to take you into because I think <laughs> even thinking about not thinking, thinking meditation is, is just like, okay, can't do that. But there was something in there that I thought was so interesting, and it was a teaching by a Buddhist named Sanadeva. And his teaching was, <laughs> it kind of scrambled my brain. He said, why would you want to focus on your tiny little bit of suffering when the world, there's so, many, so much more suffering out there. There are lots of people out there that are suffering. Right? Why would you just like, get caught up in your little suffering when there's all this other anger, hatred, despair, you know, darkness happening in the world. The same time he said, why would you focus just on your little piece of joy when there's like this infinite joy out there? And I thought that's such an interesting kind of awareness. It's not something that we necessarily think about in our unity teaching. Because I think in unity, many most of us and a lot of the teachings are about, you know, get your mind right. Get, get your own, put your mask on yourself and then you're going to be able to help other people. And so we're talking about what's our spiritual journey and our inner journey and it's a lot of it about me and what's going on inside me. Whereas the Buddhist teaching of the Bodhisattva who's, who's there until all beings are lifted up, till all beings are out of this place of what Dutka was suffering it's a, different, it's a different concept. But when I looked at that and I thought about the prayer of St. Francis, this is the same thing Francis is encouraging us. He's encouraging us to be, be this presence in the world, not just for ourselves. It's just not just because I need you to love me. It's not just because I need to feel understood or to, feel, to be pardoned of things that I've done. It's because the world needs this experience. We all need this experience. And we need to be part of, of giving this experience of love, of light, of, of hope, of faith, of joy. We need to be part of the flow of this in the world. So another little book that I've been reading, you know, my, my library is a dangerous place sometimes because I'll go in there and I'll go, let's see what's... And then this, this book happened. This book is How God Changes Your Brain. And it's an old book. It was, I mean, old. It was written in 2010. It's not old like St. Francis. I mean, he, St. Francis was 1181. And P.S., I mean, I, I like these kind of things, but you know, I'm very interested in the mystics. You know, and Hildegard von Bingen was a really, she was like one of my favorite mystics. And I was thinking about, when did these people live? Yeah. Well, Hildegard literally died two years before St. Francis was born. I thought that was kind of, like at different places, she was in Germany, she died in the late eight, 1100s. And he was born in like 1181, she died in 1179, she was 80 years old. You know, but it's interesting how these constellations of mystical teachers kind of overlap each other and carry a tradition forward, which is the Christian tradition, the Christ tradition, the Jesus tradition. If, if Christian just, you know, takes you out to somewhere you don't want to go in your mind. Um, so so it's, this has been a really interesting book to read, and I'm going to give you a few exercises, some of which you might resist. Are you ready? <laughs> so, so the cool thing about this book was he, has a, he talks a lot about the power of spiritual experience, the power of prayer and meditation, and the, the mystical experiences that people have that you know, can be like the blow your mind experiences. And maybe some of you have had those. You know, I've, had, I've had a few of those myself. And I'm not seeking those experiences because my body was pretty not functional during those times. But the experience of prayer and meditation, as he talks about in this, or actually there are two, Andrew Newberg, Newberg and Mark Waldman, they did a 30-year study of people who meditate and, and nuns and, and um, monks and really started studying their brains and what was happening inside their brains. And he came up with this way to begin to focus our consciousness. 
and he used three things, which I thought was really easy. I-R-A. The first one is that we have an intention for whatever we're going to be doing. Now, this could be an intention before you go into a meditation. It could be an intention before, like I had an intention to do a talk that would really impact and bring a, a deeper sense of peace to all of you. That was my intention this morning when I did my meditation. So that we have an intention, and then we need to relax. We need to relax. We need to relax the body. And then we need to bring awareness to what's happening inside. And so he's created, I think there are 12 different meditations that we can go through that actually do this for us. And the interesting thing about this, just a little kind of simple brain science, is that when we're able to actually slow down our breathing, it releases things in the body, neurotransmitters shifting and changing. It releases something called nitric oxide, which actually brings more blood to the body, more the body, the blood flows more freely, it lowers our blood pressure. So when we're able to do a breath meditation and breathe through the nose just very slowly and deeply, it impacts not only the physicality, but it also impacts our brain. One of the things that happens is we have an area of the brain that allows us to really focus. And this is why he has us begin with an intention. It's the frontal lobe of the brain. It's what we use to make decisions. I mean, that's very simplified, but it's an aspect of the brain that we use to make decisions. The limbic system of the brain is more about the feeling nature of who we are. And we can think about kind of this seesaw back and forth that when we get to a place of a deep meditation, we're activating something in the middle of the seesaw called the anterior cingulate. And it's able to regulate that ability we have to make wise decisions versus what might happen when we get into a place of deep emotion and anger. So when we do a deep meditation, when we relax ourselves, create an intention, begin to relax the body, and have a deeper awareness of what's going on, we begin to balance this out. It's very, very, very powerful for us. It was interesting because on one of the pages in here, he talked about how the New Thought teachings are actually using these brain sciences, which they've learned for the many meditations, to bring people into a deeper state of calm. One of the things he talked about was how people who are active in this area of the limbic system and the amygdala, which is a part of the brain that can really cause us to be, feel angry, fight or flight happens, that kind of energy gets activated in the body. It actually can create, it creates more anger. And he said it tends to be the kind of um, spiritual communities that focus on fear, think Old Testament, you know, a wrathful God, a punishing God, that that kind of spiritual experience becomes a cult kind of fundamentalist experience for the people who attend those those kinds of services. And we can see that playing out in our world right now, can't we? Whereas if we can put our attention on the peace that St. Francis is talking about, the love, the hope, the faith, the joy, if we can put our attention and intention on that using this frontal part of the brain, we're actively in a place where we're connected to, to Others, we're not in a place of fear. We're acting, we're literally activating a different part of our brain. So what I thought it would be fun to do is to give you a couple of exercises to basically begin to feel what this feels like because it's very much about an experience. It's not really the sense about practicing peace and becoming a, a, a presence for peace is about an experience and it's felt in the body and it's felt in terms of our uh, expanded awareness to everything that's around us. Um, one, of the, um, one of the things he talks about, and I think you know, we kind of know this, but some of the benefits of, of 
meditating, using this practice of intention, relaxation, and then awareness, is that it reduces our anxiety because this limbic system is no longer so active. We've moved into this center, this in anterior cingulate, which, which is able to regulate what's going on in the frontal lobes and releases some of the, the energy that's in the fear, the limbic system, and the amygdala. So it reduces, meditation can reduce any sense of anxiety and stress that we have. It also can enhance our awareness of our connection with others. It can bring us a deeper sense of empathy and feeling that sense of connection with the other, which is a very, very powerful part of being in spiritual community, isn't it? A feeling that sense of connection. And it also can improve our cognitive and intellectual functions. So I'm gonna give you an exercise and this, the, it's funny because he says this is one of the best things that we can do to begin to relax because that's part of what happens for most of us. We try, to, we try to sit and meditate and our mind's just going, oh, you know, it's going over here. And even though they say, well, you know, bring it back to a, a word, bring it back to the breath, we get lost over here. So this is a special meditation called the yawning meditation. And I want you to close your eyes and know that nobody's looking at you because I'm not going to be looking at you either. We're just, we're going to just go through this exercise together. And you're going to feel like you're stupid. You're going to feel, this is really ridiculous. I don't want to do this. This is silly. But do it anyway. Philip's already into it. <laughs> so just get comfortable in your body. And if you do this at home, you could do it standing up because a little, when you stand, there's a little more air that moves down into your lungs. But right now, I'm just going to invite you to close your eyes. And I want you to begin by taking a very deep breath and stretch your mouth wide open as you take a deep breath. And as you exhale, make a long sighing sound. I uh, don't feel like, uh, it doesn't matter if you don't feel like yawning, just Continue to do this and do fake yawns. Start doing a couple fake yawns. Just opening your mouth, deep breath. Another, just keep going on the fake yawns. Keep going. Notice as you feel a real yawn coming. Notice what you feel in your mouth. And notice your throat, what you feel in your throat and your chest. Keep yawning. Just fake it if you aren't doing it, still let it happen. Mm. <sighs> Should go for about 12 yawns. <sighs> 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 and now just keeping your eyes closed, continue to relax in the body. So, yawn.
yawning. There are 12 reasons to yawn. Yawning stimulates your alertness and your concentration. Uh, uh, yawning activates your brain and your metabolism. It improves your memory recall and your cognitive functions. Um, it enhances, enhances consciousness and your ability to look inside and lowers your stress. It relaxes every part of your body. It improves your voluntary muscle control and enhances your athletic ability. Yawning fine-tunes your sense of time and increases your empathy and your social awareness. Mm. That also enhances your sense of pleasure so just feel your body now bring an awareness to the body Do a little scan from the top of your head, down your forehead, your nose, your ears, your jaw, and your throat, to your shoulders, and down into your chest, feeling your lungs and the heart, feeling your heart. Take a deep breath, maybe another yawn wants to emerge. It's a beautiful way to deeply relax the physical body, preparing us to move into a meditation. And continuing to keep your eyes closed, I invite you to take an intention for this meditation, and it could be one of the blessings that St. Francis is offering, blessing of love, an intention to pardon or forgive, an intention to have a deeper faith for yourself and more faith in the world. It could be an intention that you bring to the world if you're carrying more hope in your life, in your heart. It could be that you're carrying a deeper sense of light, that you are a being of light, dispelling any darkness in the world that your very being is the presence of joy. Take a moment and just set for yourself this intention and this fully relaxed state. And now as you settle into the body, breathing deeply, I want you to imagine another person sitting across from you. And relax, re reflect for a moment that this person is just like you. This person lives and wants to live like you. This person wants to be happy, wants to have a sense of freedom. This person wants to be loved and appreciated. As you feel yourself, feel yourself and the other person at this very basic human level. 
beyond any particulars of what they look like, their man or woman, just simply another human sitting in front of you, just like you, the same desires and needs, the same hopes and dreams. And with that intention that you have, send that intention to this other person sitting in front of you, knowing that your being and your presence expresses this and they feel this. And now with each exhalation, imagine yourself as the other person and imagine the other person as you. Breathing in deeply and exhaling, see that body across from you as this body, as yourself, and see this body as that body. Again, on each exhalation, see that person as you, and see you as that person. Taking in a deep breath and slowly exhaling. See that person as you and see yourself as that other person. feeling the presence of peace, knowing that as an instrument of peace, you create a field, a field in which you dwell as part of the oneness of all life, as part of the one presence and power that is God. And offer gratitude for uh, this opportunity to rest in the presence, feeling your intention as an instrument of peace as you relax and carry this awareness of the gift of giving and receiving. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, it is in dying that we are born into this eternal life. And gently, as you're ready, begin to bring your awareness back into the fullness of the physical body, offering gratitude for this time apart, the blessings of meditation together in community. And as you're ready, you can gently Open your eyes. Okay. 
Jesus, que tu ajudes. I think we're going to have a little joy. fell very badly and and still needs a walker and can't drive and that was Easter Sunday so if we had had a railing Marilyn would be driving so I hope people will honor that and contribute the railing man is coming on Thursday or Wednesday so it'll be here next week <laughs> This is a beautiful chant song, another uh, Byers Beckwith, my specialty. Um, Oyeheya just is simply her chant words. I invite you to continue in the peace of this beautiful meditation and that we just had and shared together. Let this beautiful music also cradle you and, and keep you all week. And sing along with me if you want to. One more. 
Thanks for singing. Beautiful. <laughs> and I'm going to look for the invisible thing here. <laughs> <coughs> We now have a glorious opportunity to show our faith in God's source as we give our love offerings to support the church and meet the needs of uh, all of us here to keep the lights on and the building open. So let's hold our love offerings in our hand as we say our prayer. Divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive, and I am grateful. Although that I decided I want to spotlight Sahar, so we're going to do something a little different.